As a blacksmith, sooner rather than later, you're going to have to cut materials. One way to cut materials is, is hot at the anvil over a hardy. What is a hardy? A hardy really is little more than a chisel, only it's a chisel that is used instead of driving it down onto the work, you place this in the anvil and you drive the work down over the chisel. The square hole in an anvil is called a hardy hole because it is for this tool. There are lots of other tools that also fit in the hardy hole, but technically speaking they are not hardies. The hardy is the cutoff tool and they can be made for hot cutting or cold cutting. A uh, cold cutting hardy has a much blunter edge so that it'll survive the cold work. So while we certainly refer to bottom fullers or bottom swedges or other specialty shaped bottom tools as hardies, that's technically really not correct, but everybody knows what you're talking about. So these are either hardy tools or bottom tools, but a hardy properly are these tools. They're chisels. They have a sharp edge so that you can cut things. Some of them are one-sided and some two-sided. All the ones I have here are two-sided hardies. This is the one I use at the anvil most of the time. It's really way too big, way too monstrous, but because I have an inch and a quarter hardy hole in my anvil, I needed something a little above average. And this is actually made from a recycled hot cut that was a monstrous hot cut that was so beat to death the eye was deformed, the back was cracked. So I just cut the end off of it and I welded a shank to it and I made a hardy. That isn't necessarily the way I would recommend making one because I really don't like taking old tools out of the, away from what they were originally meant to be, but that one was in such bad shape I did it anyways. This is a store-bought hardy. And you can still buy these, uh, Pay Tool, Centaur Forge, Blacksmith's Depot, other places. You can find them online, uh, uh, on eBay and things like that. You can find Hardee's. You can find them at your local farrier supply. And they usually come with a three-quarter or one-inch shank. This one had a three-quarter inch shank, and at the time I had a one-inch hardy hole in my anvil, so I welded a piece of tubing over the shank, and it will fit in the one-inch hole now. Of course, that doesn't fit in my one and a quarter inch hole very easily. This one is one we're going to cover how to make this style of hardy, and I'll tell you why it, it's such a nice way to go in just a minute. And I can use it in my anvil because I have this inch and a quarter tube on a plate with a one inch hole, so now these one inch tools will fit, fit in my anvil. Oh, that one's a little bit tight. So what makes this hardy a good way to go? This is actually a repurposed jackhammer bit. Jackhammer bits have collars. Unfortunately, I don't have a full-size bit because I've cut all the collars off of them. But that goes on a bit something like this. And this one was a bigger bit. I wish I still had that collar. And this makes a nice shoulder that's already there, already done for you, and is ready to go and into your anvil. You just have to square this up and make it fit the hardy hole. And that, you can see that that was done on this one and then the end was forged into the chisel. Very quick, very simple way to create hardy tools. You can make the, the hot cut style hardy. You could make a butcher which we'll need to do for an upcoming for our grill project. We're going to have to have a butcher tool. We'll talk about that as a separate video. But you could also turn these into small swedges and other specialty tools just by leaving it longer and doing different things to it. So that's a real good makeshift way to get a hardy. And I have a few of the collars cut off of some jackhammer bits that we're going to be able to use for that purpose. This bit is bigger and I could probably actually make a, a hardy for my bigger anvil with it. And I could also use this as a starting point as a great big hardy because it's already got that big chisel edge. These tend to be something like S2, and I'd look that up in a chart, but I would also do test hardness and hardening and tempering on them to make sure that they behave the way you want. 
And you can get smaller jackhammer bits. If you've got a three quarter inch hardy hole, you can go to a smaller bit. Just whatever works appropriate for your situation is good for you. Another thing that will work, this is a bit of sucker rod. This is the knuckle end. This is where the threads had been. And this is about one inch square. Different size sucker rods will have different square sections. And this would be easy. It would be a very small cutoff end, but it would be functional. And that might be worth looking into. These would also make great bottom rivet sets this way. I don't know if I can get a sucker rod with an inch and a quarter end or not. I need to look. And I don't know what this is. This is off of some piece of machinery. I found it in a scrap yard. Uh, probably a piece of mining equipment that grinds up stuff or maybe the thing that grinds up asphalt on the highway. I'm not sure. It's a tooth of some sort. When I spark test it, it sparks very similar to W1 or 1095. So it's a good high carbon steel and it'll make a good tool. And because it has a shoulder, and this is a little bigger than my hardy hole, it would be fairly easy to make this fit. The only problem with it is, is it's a little bit short here, so I don't know that I would make a, a cutoff tool with it, but some sort of a little forming die where this flat is might be very nice. So there's some ideas for salvage material, and I've got another one that I'll show you here in just a minute as we make some of these. But I think we're going to start with one of these jackhammer bits, and we're going to make a simple hardy out of this and we're going to make it fit a one inch hardy hole in an anvil because that's about what these are sized for and I either have to use my adapter on my anvil or I just use it at the other anvil. The one I keep over here by the bench has a one inch hole in it. Now squaring up this roughly one inch hexagon is a lot easier to do if you do it under a press, a power hammer or a treadle hammer and you can usually keep the edges very clean and crisp that way. It also is a good thing to do if you have a set hammer and can work with a striker. A set hammer would just allow you to get right up there and a striker could strike that and there's no risk of messing up that collar that forms your shoulder so this sits on the anvil nicely but I assume you probably don't have that stuff and if you do you already know how to use it so I don't have to tell you how to use it. So we're going to do this just at the anvil with the hammer and we're going to be as careful as we can and try not to mess that collar up. So this is just a matter of taking this down to one inch square. I put the collar right against the edge of the anvil and try and bring my hammer straight down. My body position, I get my head almost right over the the anvil. I don't want to hit, hit myself in the nose of my hammer though. And you can use your hardy hole as your measuring device if you have the correct size hardy hole. But I've got this plate. See now that just almost fits. It can be a little bit smaller. Snug is better than too floppy as long as it doesn't wedge in there and get stuck. But you can come back with a file and clean this up. It's getting, getting closer. We're going to heat it up again. So we just keep working where we have been. And it's okay if the far end tapers a little bit. It makes it a little faster and easier to drop in the hole because it's not as snug a fit. That's getting very close. You can see this is where a striker Striking the set hammer here would really clean this up right here. It would make a very quick, very accurate job of this. Now not every one inch hardy hole is going to be a perfect one inch. 
some will be a little large, some will be a little small. So the ideal is that you make this fit your anvil. Yeah, it's just almost there. One way to do it now that it's close. Just drive that down on there and hope it doesn't stick. And it pays to turn it 90 degrees, give it a few more taps, and work all the way around all four orientations here. Just in case your hardy hole isn't perfectly symmetrical, you want to make sure it's going to fit no matter how you drop it in there. So now we know we have a nice square shoulder. We know that's going to fit. At worst, we may do a little cleanup with a file. And we're going to need to clean up this, this edge where it's kind of puckered over there. But that's not a big deal. We'll just do that with a grinder or file. So now we need to make the cutting edge. It's a little bit more straightforward. Now this is hexagonal. So it's not symmetrical depending on which way you forge the edge. I think it's easier to start with two flats and bring it out. It makes for a little bit wider edge at the, the corners of the hex. But you could do it this way if there was some reason you wanted it like that. So this is really just a matter of forging this into a, a chisel shape. It's okay if it flares out, but if you don't like that, you can bring it back in line. You could make a fuller out of this by not taking it clear to a point and rounding it off. You could make a single sided hot cut, make it into a cold cut, make it into a butcher, which we'll do with our other little piece of uh, jackhammer bit at some point. When we get back to our grill project, we'll need the butcher, so we'll talk about what a butcher is. Right now, that's just a teaser. I'm checking this to make sure that it's still in line this way. Now this is what you call a failure. And you may not be perfectly evident. And I actually this will be a useful tool. So it's it's not a complete failure, but it isn't what I set out to do. And anybody see right there why it's a failure. It doesn't have anything to do with the little cold shut there. We can grind that off. When I picked a flat to flatten, I didn't think about how it was going to orient with the shank. So I got it 45 degrees off with the shank. So I'm either going to have to twist that, which will probably work just fine. And we may try that just to save it. Or I end up with a 45 degree hardy, which Maybe is isn't such a bad idea anyways. That's what happens when you're talking to the camera and you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Now, I've had a few people comment that they like seeing how to fix a mistake. Well, this is a mistake. Let's see if we can fix it with this great big twisting wrench. over twist it a little bit because I think as we forge it it will untwist just a hair. Look at that, we were able to fix it. So you can save a lot of your mistakes. It's better not to make them in the first place though. 
That was just pure carelessness on my part. Mostly I just need to clean that up and straighten it after that little fiasco. Got it just a little bit crooked. It's looking a lot better. I think that's about all we really need to do to that. Trying to keep it all in line. Putting the twist in does make it behave a little bit weird as you forge it out. One side wants to bend one way, one side wants to bend the other. Way easier to not screw it up in the first place. Okay, I'm going to bring that back up to heat one more time, and then I'm going to put it in the vermiculite to cool. Remember, we need to anneal tools to take all the stress out before filing or grinding in preparation for heat treatment. Now of course that hardy is going to need to be hardened and tempered but it needs to anneal first so that should sit in the vermiculite overnight ideally at least till this afternoon so we may not get that in on this video. So instead let's go on and let's look at a couple other options for making quick hardy tools and let's look at this piece of sucker rod next we're going to take this flare and we're just going to go ahead and square that up so it blends with this square. You could cut it off and leave the short shank there. And then we're going to try to square up this shoulder a little bit in our, our adapter plate here or in your hardy hole of your anvil. And then we'll decide what we're going to do with the top there. Like I say it's a little small for an actual cutoff hardy. So I just want to square that lump up. It may create a cold shut. Make sure you hold this shoulder off the edge of the anvil. But I'm not real worried about a cold shut down there because I'm not going to harden it in that area. The cold shut is just where it folds over on itself and doesn't forge weld. It's just a, a little space like folding paper. The problem is that's a place where a crack can propagate. But like I say this part of the hardy doesn't need to be hardened and it never gets stress so I'm not too worried about a little cold shut there. I've actually got this at a welding heat. We may be able to weld down what would otherwise be a cold shut. I'm not worried about it too much. But if we can get it to weld, we might as well. Plus, working that high of a heat, it forges a lot faster. You just don't want to burn it or decarburize it if it's part of the tool that's going to be um, the working part of the tool that needs hardening. So 
So there's our piece of sucker rod. We're ready to kind of upset this shoulder down a little bit. the seat down there on the the hardy or on the hardy hole I should say and I'll turn it four corners just to make sure they all fit the same some hardy holes are a little crooked a little off center remember in an old anvil these were punched so they can be quite irregular but that's all we really need to do. That will sit just fine for what a, the purposes a hardy it has to deal with. There's our shoulder. So now we'll work the other end. Now just a hint, you know, we got that off the, the other time. On these V-bit tongs, if you're holding a square and your tongs are straight up and down or perfectly horizontal, you're at a 45 degree angle to that square shank. So I want my tongs at a 45 degree angle, plus I can visualize the square. So let's try not to make the same mistake twice. I'm just going to go ahead and make a cutoff hardy out of this. I might make a straight sided hardy. That bar is spreading nicely. So I'm going to make a straight sided hardy, so I'm pushing this all over to one side. But that's spread out to about an inch. About an inch and a sixteenth. So that's a fairly useful size for a hardy. I think I'll actually work this over the horn so I don't end up with a step there. As you can see the shape we're starting with. I'm going to draw that out just a little bit more. Actually, so it's easier for you to see, instead of going to the horn, I'll use this fuller. That's pretty much all we need to do for this one. I can take it down a little bit thinner, but it's going to need to be ground anyways. But by pushing it over, that gives us a nice straight flat side. You want a straight sided hardy if you need a straight end cut. In some bars you want as neat a cut as possible so you don't have to go back and forge or grind or file the end of the bar when you're done. You just end up with a nice clean cut. Some bars it doesn't matter. After forging this straight side a little bit, I probably messed up my shoulder. So I'm going to put that back in the hardy hole and go back through this routine a little bit. Just going to start forging in the final bevel, but I'll leave it thick. Make sure this is fairly straight up and down on the the back side. That's all we're going to do to that. And this goes in to be annealed. Let's make one more hardy. This is perhaps the simplest. And you can do this without tongs if you have a long enough piece of stock to start with. This is a piece of coil spring. This particular piece is three quarters of an inch in diameter. And I think it will be sufficient for this project. If you need to 
uncoil coil spring, you may need tongs, and that might present a problem if you haven't made any tongs yet, or if you need a hardy to cut the material for the tongs or whatever. If you don't have tongs, you can leave this on a long bar. Coil spring, you probably need tongs to uncoil. So start with something like 4140 or 01 or a piece of sucker rod or something else that is already a straight bar when you start with it. And that will make your life a little bit easier. For a piece of 4140 in half by one inch, which would be ideal for this style, is probably about $30 from some place like McMaster Car plus shipping and you would be able to make oh, four or five similar tools out of it. It would be suitable for some punches and some other things. So it's a good investment and isn't too bad and that's less than you'd pay for the, buying a hardy from one of the suppliers. But we're going to use this piece of coil spring because I have some tongs but you could do it with a long bar or if you've made your first pair of tongs you can do it this way. For this style of Hardy, what we really need is some flat stock. Ideally, half the, the width of the hardy hole thick and as wide as the hardy hole is wide. So half by one. So I'm going to forge this down until it's one inch wide. If it's a little narrower than half, we'll just live with it. It's about seven eighths. Try to keep it fairly symmetrical. You don't want fat spots and thin spots. Not quite there yet. We're definitely going to be a little bit narrow. This will be about 3 8 by 1 inch when I'm done. I get that last little bit. I'm going to go ahead and peen it a little bit wider. You end up with a little narrow spot down the middle. It won't hurt anything. Again, the ideal would be half by one. So if you're going to go out and buy material to do this, so you can make this without tongs, just buy half by one material. It's just a hair under one. I think we're probably going to end up leaving that. I don't want to make it too thin. And we'll get an opportunity to work with it a little bit. I want to do the other side. What's going to happen is I'm going to forge the hardy on one end of this and then we're going to fold it and double it over till it fits. So we need enough material at least two inches to stand up, maybe an inch for the bend and probably four inches for the, the hardy shank. So that's seven inches and another inch for the other side. So we need at least eight inches of this. And this bar is about a little over 10 inches long. So I'm just going to go ahead and finish up the whole thing. And then I'll cut it off when I'm done.
I've gone to the peen a little sooner on this end and I'll probably end up just a hair wider and a hair thicker which will be ideal. I'm not really trying to thin it when I come back over to the the edge here I'm just trying to keep things straight keep the lumps out so what we end up with there we're again at 7 8 by 3 8 that may be the best we're going to do so the next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead I'm going to bend this first because we're going to end up pounding on this end that will be the chisel as part of this. So I'm going to offset about two inches and give it a bend. This exact measurement isn't that important. It's just enough for it to stand up where you can work on it. But this is also a thin cross section so you don't want it too tall. Now you can do a square upset corner here if you want to. It's not absolutely vital so I'm not going to worry about it too much you do want to make sure you don't put a nick on the inside of the corner though that create a cold shut and that's where it would fracture either during heat treating or during use that's why it's a good idea to have a rounded edge on your anvil. So that's really all we need to do to that. Now I'm going to put another bend in about an inch out. Just enough to make a little, little wrinkle there. I suppose I should say dog leg would be a more appropriate term. Again, a square upset corner would be pretty, but it's not necessary. And we're going to do some refinement to this after we're done. So our next step is going to be able to bend the long leg up parallel right through here. And we want about two inches in the hardy hole, maybe a little bit more so that there's now hardy tools can kind of bounce up and down and you don't want it to bounce out so as long as it's got a long shank on it you'll be okay so we just want to put a nice bend in here I'm using a little bit more than I plan on originally this is another place a bending fork really comes in handy but you don't need one you just going to have to do a little bit more back and forth fussing I'm actually going to end up using almost all of this longer bar because I left a little bit more here and here and, and for the shank. I think eight inches would be the minimum. Now we don't necessarily want to make this super tight because we already know we're a little bit undersized so that's going to fit in our hardy hole. Now we're going to need to bend that little piece out right there. So if you drop this in the the hole, with any luck you can get a chisel down in there and get that started. And once that starts to go, you can just drive that over here. Drive the other end over there. And you're starting to get the idea here. Now this is probably the cheesiest of the hardies. The weirdest, or however you want to call it. But it's also functional. Try and get everything straightened back up. I think this would have been better if I had left a less here. As short a section there as you can get by with is probably better. But for an anvil without this extra plate, that would work just fine. Well, this will certainly result in a tool that you can use. Like I say, I think it's the least desirable of the three techniques we've talked about today and it's a little bit fiddly but it has the advantage of not needing a great big piece of steel you don't have to go out and find a sucker rod knuckle or a 
um, jackhammer bit with a collar on it. The difference though, I think those two methods, you're making a tool you're going to be proud of for years to come. This method you're making a temporary tool because you probably won't use it all that much. So we'll finish it off with a chisel edge. And I'm going to let that flare out a little bit just to make it a little bit larger cutting edge on the finished tool. So that's the, the whole thing right there. Like I say, with this adapter plate, it hangs over a little bit. That's not real ideal. But if I were using it in my other anvil with the one inch hardy hole, that would work okay. That was too small a piece of steel to start with, and this bend is a little bit, bit long there. I think we could have done better. And if you make several of these, you'll do better each time. You could make fullers out of this, you could make small swedges doing it this way, you could make a butcher this way. Quick, simple tools, especially if you invest in that one piece of tool steel for a one inch hardy hole that would be half by one inch, and you wouldn't have to do half as much work as what I did. You just have to do the bends and shape the end. It'd be quick and efficient. So there are three ways that you could make a fairly quick hardy tool, either starting with a found object of salvaged steel like the jackhammer bit or the sucker rod knuckle that is pretty much ready to fit your hardy hole and already has a fat spot to make a shoulder. And the third method out of flat bar, or I started with round bar, I should have started with something a little bit wider, there just wasn't quite enough in that piece of coil spring, but it's what I had, and you would certainly be able to do that if that's what you have. You can make do, it's not the best tool in the world, it'll last forever, but you probably won't be as proud of it as you would be the other ones, and in a future video we will cover a more traditional way of doing hardies and creating a shoulder out of a solid bar, and maybe we'll even forge weld one up out of multiple smaller bars so that we can achieve that that shoulder without having to draw it all down. We'll do it by forge welding and maybe even forge weld in a tool steel bit and make the whole thing out of mild steel or a really ambitious wrought iron. But I don't know that I'll be that ambitious. Plus I don't have any big wrought iron to start with so we'd have to weld up a big wrought iron billet. And I know you guys are right now thinking let's do that. So that's just going to be more work for me. That's okay. That's kind of what we're here for. So anyways that's a, a quick look at the forging process. We'll do another video to harden and te temper those, or I should say grind, harden, and temper. It's important to let them anneal and not rush the process if you can. You can get away with normalizing and just let them air cool and get back to it this afternoon if you needed that tool sooner. But I'd rather let them anneal overnight, plus I have other work to do this afternoon, so we'll do that. This has taken about two hours total to forge those three tools and that includes fire maintenance time, heating time, sitting here discussing it, talking to the camera, moving the camera around, and a couple of bathroom breaks. So there's less than an hour involved in each tool so far. By the time they are ground, hardened, and tempered, it'll be close to an hour per tool. That's not a bad time investment to get a tool that you're going to use for years or maybe have your entire blacksmithing career. So it's worth taking the time to make a, a decent tool, and I strongly encourage you to get out to the shop and make some tools. We'll harden and temper those in the next, next well, I, okay. We won't harden and temper in the very next video, because I'll probably shoot another short video this afternoon just to keep the videos progressing along. So it'll be a video probably on Wednesday I'll shoot that video. So today's Monday, so in two days probably we'll do that. How's that for vague and rambling and off topic? Anyways, get out to the shop, start making some hardies, go to your local scrapyard, or, I should have mentioned this earlier, the place that I get jackhammer bits is a rental store, a rental place that rents jackhammers. So they specialize in 
construction tools that they rent to either professionals or to homeowners and they frequently have jackhammer bits that they have resharpened to the point that there's just not enough left to resharpen. Sometimes they give them away for free. Sometimes they want to charge you five or ten dollars for one. It's probably worth the ten bucks even though that's a lot of money for something that some other store might give you but it'll save you driving around town trying all the rental stores. But it's worth checking because they, they sometimes have those and you'll find them in other people's scrap piles and in scrap yards. So it's worth checking there too for some of this stuff. Anyways, I've talked enough. I'm keeping you from working. I'm keeping myself from working. Go back to work. Have fun. Stay safe. Wear your safety glasses. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you later.